now to, uh, uh, to, uh, to get down to cases. I know that practically everyone here realizes that the great era of American fiction ran for only slightly more than 45 years, beginning in 1893 and ending in 1939. In that period, we have uh, Dreiser, F. Scott Fitzgerald, Dos Passos, Hemingway, Faulkner, Edith Wharton, um, Richard Wright, Zora Neale Hurston, uh, James M. Cain, uh, for, that, uh, for that matter. Ranks of, uh, uh, and did I mention Faulkner? I hope so. Um, and, and, uh, and William Faulkner. Um, there has never been anything like it. Uh, and it's beginning to look like there never will uh, again. Um, the, at, the end, at the end point, 1939, the end of the only major era in American literature, uh, was, of course, John Steinbeck's uh, The Grapes of Wrath. Um, but I want to talk about the man who was at the very beginning, and that is Stephen Crane in 1893. Uh, the Library of America has a fabulous Stephen Crane volume. It has a Maggie, a girl of the streets. It has uh, <clears throat> the, the red badge of carriage. It has many of the, uh, the short stories, the open boat, uh, and a lot of his uh, uh, journalism, poetry. Uh, it's, it's, a fabulous, uh, it's a fabulous volume, uh, which I look at all <clears throat> the time. Now, Crane uh, was one of 11 children. He has six brothers who are older than he was. Uh, he had a brother who was the uh, Jersey Shore uh, bureau chief for the New York Tribune. Uh, his mother also was an, ass an assistant. Uh, <coughs> Crane had dropped out of two colleges by the time he was 19. Um, incidentally, if you add up all of the um, academic experience of Hemingway, Faulkner, um, John Steinbeck, uh, and Stephen Crane, it would not, uh, there would not be a one year. It wouldn't even add up to a freshman year. That doesn't count, it was uh, an informational aside. No, I was going to, um, in any event, uh, <clears throat> Crane was working as an assistant to his um, brother, and he covered two lectures of the sort that are given to tourists in the summertime on the Jersey Shore. He, he grew up in Asbury Park. Uh, one was by Hamlin Garland. Hamlin Garland was an apostle of what was known here as the new realism, but it was actually the naturalism that had originated in France with writers like uh, Zola, Flaubert, and uh, Maupassant. Uh, and he, in this lecture, he said, American writers must realize there's not enough to give us realism uh, with sentiment added to sweeten it up a little bit the way Dickens did. You have to be unsparing, tell it exactly uh, the way it is, and don't, just don't think about uh, sentiment. About nine months later, Crane covered another lecture. This was by Jacob Rees, the man who had written the famous book, How the Other Half Lived, and had also taken uh, marvelous photographs, uh, which are now part of a profound part of the history of photography in this country. And uh, uh, <clears throat> these two, these two uh, lecturers were sunk in his mind. Uh, he took Hamlet Gall a little bit too literally, and he was writing a piece for the New York Tribune uh, about the America Day parade of the junior order of the uh, junior, uh, junior order of the Union of American Mechanics. Uh, and he decided to take Hamlin Garland at his word and, and tell exactly what it was like. So he describes these sloped-shouldered yabos who, um, with dirt under their uh, uh, fingernails who were trotting like mules along the parade route. He says the only thing more that worse was the onlookers. He says the average Asbury Parker uh, is a person who, once holding up a dollar bill in front of his eyes, is unable to see that anybody on the other side of that bill has any rights uh, at all. 
course he was five. So <laughs> he then decided to take up Jacob Rees, uh, uh, Jacob Rees's motif, and he moved to the Lower East Side of, of New York. Rees had not, Rees had expressly said, I'm not a novelist, I'm a reformer. I've seen something that cannot be allowed to go on. So he didn't capture the language and all the specifics. But this is something that, uh, 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 that Crane did. Crane, 21 years old, a really good looking young man to the point of being pretty slender, uh, turns himself in, in his appearance into that of a Bowery bum. Uh, he had his wispy beard, which he's allowed to just kind of straggle like Fu Manchu on, 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 a, on, a, on a bad day. And he eventually began to uh, sleep in uh, flop houses, not once, but repeatedly. And he would invite friends. How'd you like to spend the night? In the he had got no return visitors, but he was there uh, all the time. He would talk about the foul odors uh, and the uh, malignant diseases on wings that seemed to be uh, uh, floating through the place. And unfortunately, that is probably where Crane uh, developed tuberculosis, which was to kill him at the age of, uh, of, of 28. But the, I submit that, uh, that, um, that was the first, Maggie O'Girl of the Streets was the first real American novel of the city, in the sense that as with Zola, as with uh, uh, Maupassant, the city is a character in your life and there, you have no individual psychology. You have a psychology that intersects with the city, which uh, is bound to change your life in, in, in some way. Maggie is a wonderful character. She's a girl who is a, sort of the one who blossoms out of a dunghill in, a, in the slums. A beautiful, beautiful uh, young woman. But he presents her accurately. She's stupid. Um, she is weak. Uh, she's morally lax, and very early in the book, she goes off uh, at the age of uh, 16 or 17 to live with a hustler named Pete. That's all, the only name you get. Um, and he, she is so impressed by Pete, he takes her to a beer hall. And in this beer hall are masses of workers with the calloused hands, as he, as he points out, after a, the drudgery of the long days uh, work who are floating away in a vast river of, of uh, intoxication and alcoholic um, amnesia, uh, drink, just drinking beer as fast as they can, uh, as fast as they can uh, drink it. To Maggie, this is a wondrous sight, and she thinks that Pete must be very much a man of the world because he's he seems so above it all, so unimpressed. Um, and she, the way he speaks, impresses her so much. The waiter comes by and says, two beers. <clears throat> and the uh, waiter comes back with the two beers. And, <clears throat> he's, and Pete says, what's eating you? Uh, <clears throat> why don't you, what are you doing bringing the, uh, the lady? Why don't you bring the lady a big glass? What's that pony? You know, a pony, a small glass or serving uh, uh, liqueurs. Uh, and, the, and the waiter says, don't get smart. And as the waiter walks off, Pete says, ah, get off the earth, which means get off the earth. Um, Maggie says to her, herself she, that she realizes that Pete has brought out all of this elegance and his knowledge of high-class customs just to impress uh, her. And her heart warms as she reflects upon his condescension. That was one of the favorite uh, figures of speech of Crane, metonymy, where you substitute the instrument for the actual uh, term. The real term she's saying is sophisticated, uh, but she substitutes the evidence of the sophistication by saying uh, uh, con condescending. Um, a little bit later, as we all know, uh, Crane wrote uh, The Red Badge of Courage, which seems like a complete departure from Maggie, uh, a girl of the streets, uh, in that it seems to be uh, historical. Well, it is historical, but being somewhat just an absolutely dedicated uh, reporter uh, dedicated to facts, uh, he had run across a collected edition of the soldiers' memoirs from the Civil War that had been collected in Century Illustrated magazine and put out as a four-volume work. And in this four-volume work was every conceivable detail uh, that anyone would need to write about a war. 
He wrote The Red Badge of Courage. It was a, the best-selling book in the United States. It was an international bestseller. To this day, it's considered the greatest portrayal of a, a soldier in the midst of uh, battle, even better than Tolstoy's famous uh, description of the battle at Sebastopol. Um, it, and at this point, we realize why every writer should have a Lynn Nesbitt, um, which is to say a superior agent. Uh, from this, the, the high tide of his whole career, which was uh, 1895 to 1897, um, Crane, total income from the Red Badge of Courage, read all over the world, was $1,200. Um, the reason he needed uh, an agent was his advance was $90. Uh, the company was Appleton. I don't know if it's still in business or not, but it should hang its, its head. Um, and they gave him no royalties until the, uh, the firm had recouped all of its uh, costs of, of publication. And they had ingenious accounts then, too. It was not just, <laughs> not just in Hollywood uh, uh, today. As a result, for the rest of his life, uh, Crane had to do uh, journalistic vignettes. They kept asking him to repeat what he'd been successful at. They kept sending him off to wars, wh where he conducted himself very bravely, uh, uh, incidentally. Uh, they kept sending him into the slums. Uh, many of the pieces that describe that are which look like preludes to Maggie, a girl of the streets, are actually written after uh, Maggie of the girl of the streets to get an, another seventy-five dollars, maybe or a uh, or a hundred. Um, in the end, uh, the tuberculosis uh, was the uh, finished him off, uh, and he was his last words on his deathbed were. Don't worry, I've just cleared the hedges, and it's not so bad on the other side. Um, it was in, 19, uh, in 1900. Now, that was the start of the great period in American literature. The great period ended in 1939. What happened? What happened? Well, what happened was, suddenly, American writers, after a triumph that had made American writing famous all over the world, uh, discovered that the French didn't do it that way. Uh, the French didn't like the muck of everyday life. They liked sensibility. They'd all been started by Mallarmé, Rambeau, um, Baudelaire. You shouldn't write about facts. You should write about wafts of sensibility. And that's what our most talented young writers uh, have been doing ever since the Second World War. They've been wafting and wafting and wafting and wafting. Uh, very shortly, American fiction, literary fiction we're talking about, American literary fiction is going to be in the same place poetry is. Poetry is up on the peak of a mountain, uh, ice, an ice-covered peak. Uh, it must be very important to be up so high, but unfortunately, it's, it's much easier to praise them than to actually visit them. Um, the same will soon be true of our, uh, uh, our novelists. It's going to be so much more enjoyable to just praise them from down here uh, than to go up and, and, uh, and pay uh, a visit. It may be too late uh, to turn out a generation of, uh, of Stephen Cranes, because they'll probably all be writing for The Simpsons. <laughs> but one can still hope. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.